Let's turn back to the word of the Lord. We're in Psalm 119 again. We're on the home stretch now. We'll be finishing up here by, oh, I guess the first week of May. We'll be finishing this up. But we are going to look at two stanzas today. And remember, each of these stanzas begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so in Hebrew, every verse in each stanza begins with the same Hebrew letter. Now, that's a, that's a very nice, poetic way of writing. It's not necessarily an easy way of writing, but it is an inspired way of writing because all of God's Word is inspired. It's God-breathed. Amen? And so that's just one more wonder in and of itself. But you think about the word wonder with me for a few moments here. That word is not used a whole lot any longer. We don't, we don't marvel at very much anymore, and I would say probably that technology has at least a little bit of something to do with that. There are such technological advances, it seems like every day we have more and more advances in our technologies that, that we don't have a sense of awe that much any longer. God's not doing the things that He did during the time of Moses and Joshua, during the time of Elijah and Elisha, during the time of Jesus and the apostles even, when His Word was being given, codified, verified that it came from God. We don't see such things anymore, and so... We rely on stories, perhaps, but definitely we see technological marvels today. I can remember when Apple's M3 chip was developed, and it was just released earlier this year. They're already about to release their M4 chip. Now, I don't know if you know much about the, the, the chip that a Apple produced, but it was, even by Intel standards, it was a modern marvel. Even the creators and the, and the CEO and the CFO of Intel, you know, the Intel chips that are in most PCs, right? They marveled at the technological advances of that Apple M1 chip. It was way beyond anything that Intel had ever conceived possible. And it did nothing but further Intel's capability to create better computer processors. Then the M2 came out. Then the M3. And now, again, just... Three months after the release of the M3, they have now doubled the capacity and the capabilities of the M3 chip with the M4. We have the capability with our cell phones, our computers, our TVs to see what happens on the other side of the world as it happens. In fact, yesterday we saw what was happening in the nation of Israel when they were ruthlessly bombarded by this morning's count over 300 drones and ballistic missiles cruise missiles, and others because of a supposed attack on a Iranian, Iranian, excuse me, uh, embassy, consulate. The reality is that a building next to the consulate was attacked and terrorists were annihilated during this war on terror that Israel is engaged in. And then the propaganda by the Iranian regime all of a sudden now makes it into something that it really wasn't to begin with. It's another excuse for evil to reign and rain down terror. And so we saw that. We saw it happening live. It was, it was a little unnerving. And I assume it would be for those who do not know Jesus. Amen? The world is on fire. In fact, World War III was trending yesterday on social media. But we saw it happening live. Technology made it so. We don't have to rely on word of mouth, word of mouth, word of mouth, telegraphs, right? And runners or riders in the night. It'd be hard to ride from Israel anyway, right? All the way horseback, I'm thinking, right? Paul Revere days. But the advances of technology have made us marvel less at things that should captivate us. And so we think, how in the world can the Bible compete with modern marvels? AI, now writing homework. Oh, kids, that sounds so tempting, right? AI, writing the news. AI doing much today that it needs not do any day. And we're in awe of artificial intelligence. I saw this morning, about 3 o'clock, I was just checking. I woke up and was praying and just checked on kind of the state of the world through social media. That technology allowed that. And I saw how artificial intelligence is changing the world of street cleaning. That we have AI-driven street cleaners that are going to revolutionize the America that we know. That's going to put people out of work. That's what I know, right? I don't think it's everything it's cracked up to be. 
But people marvel and fawn over these advances. And we've lost our sense of awe for the things that really matter. When a life is changed and they demonstrate it visibly by the ordinance of Christian baptism. We should marvel at such things. Amen? And we saw that today. And through teary eyes for many of us today. Because it's a beautiful thing. It's a miraculous thing. And every day the Lord is doing the miraculous. Changing dead sinners into born-again believers. Amen? That is the greatest miracle, I think, that we could ever hope for today. To see lives changed. But God's Word is, in fact, a wonderful thing as well. And so I would like to invite you to look at verse 129 and following today. As we make our way through these two stanzas, Lord willing, we are in Pe today, P-E in your English Bibles, in our English Bibles. But we're going to make our way through even through Sade, and we're going to see how the Word of God is a wonderful thing. And I hope that you and I as Christians today will be inspired and challenged to recognize anew how awe-inspiring God's Word is. Amen? Amen? I, I think it's fair to say that we could probably all read a little more of God's Word every day. Amen? We could probably study a little more every day in God's Word. We could slow down and turn off our technologically advanced devices and get back to this word. Now I know if you're like me, sometimes I'll, I'll take mine. I've got, I've got my entire pastoral library in my phone now through Logos, which some of you bought for me years ago and I've been adding to all these years. So that's a wonderful use of technology. But there's still something about the feel of a page, amen? And turning to it and not having to worry about glitches on the screen. Static and it cutting out. To have this in our hands, to hold there's just something about that. So I want to look at six things. And we'll do these very quickly. I promise you. All right? Each of these could be a Sunday, but we're not going to do that. We're going to just make our way through here and see, firstly, that God's Word is wonderful because it gives sight to the simple. Now, I think being called simple is probably not something that's high on our value chart. Right? But we are a simple people. And in Christ, that's really true of us. Christ is everything and we are nothing. Amen? And the more we walk with Christ, the more we begin to see and understand that. That He is all and we're nothing. Like Brent was talking about this morning. Far be it from Brent to stand in the way of the Lord using him to mightily read the Scripture. Or perhaps one day to proclaim the Scripture. Just throwing that out there, brother. Right? But it's true for all of us. We're, we're simple. Look at what it says in 129. Your testimonies are wonderful. There's the all again. Therefore my soul observes them. They're great, so I'm going to keep them. I'm going to observe them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. That's me, the simple. I opened my mouth wide and panted, for I longed for your commandments. Notice the train in these three verses. Wonderful, observing, giving light and understanding, and then this panting. There is wonder. The wonder brings us to obedience, to obeying God's Word. The obeying, the more we obey, the more we understand. He gives us insight. He opens the blind eyes of the simple person, right? We understand, and the more we understand, the more we long for and desire more of God and His Word. It's something about when you really dig in one day, and you start reading, and you don't want to read. Maybe you're reading before work. And the more you're in that Word, the longer you want to be in that Word. Amen? I'm sure many of us have experienced that here. You don't want to go to work. You don't want to go to school. And maybe that's for other reasons, right? But if you're in the Word, that's a good reason. You want to have more. That wonder creates an obedience in us and an understanding which leads to a desire for more, for more, for more. Do you remember the old days? Some of you kids probably don't remember this. Many of us adults have probably forgot as well. Do you remember what a foldable map looked like? Anybody? Do you remember what a foldable map did? Right? You go on a trip, it's in the glove box. Dad's driving because dads drove back then, right? Right? That's right. No, no one drove as good as the dad drove back then. Now, obviously, that's changed now, but dad drives, and so he's lost. But Mark, he's not going to admit he's lost. He wants to verify he's on the right path. Anybody relate to that? Right? We're, we don't get lost, right, men? Arr, 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 arr. There you go. There's your Tim Allen manhood bark, okay? 
So what we do is we ask our wives, our co-pilots, maybe it's our children in that time, to reach into the glove box and pull out the old map. I want to make sure we're going the right way. Let's, let's verify this is the fastest route or the safest route, whatever excuse that we make. But you open up the map, you unfold it, and it gives revelation. You're on the right path or you're not. You're going where you're supposed to go or you're way off course, right? That's the unfolding. That's the idea that the psalmist is speaking of here. The unfolding of God's Word gives light. It gives understanding. It helps us to know that we're going where we're supposed to go. Amen? Now we have Siri or Waze, right? And you can make Waze talk to you in all sorts of ways. That's, I didn't mean that pun there, but that's a good one. Write that down somebody for me, right? Write that down for later. So, so we use those things, and, and it's crazy. Back in those days, I think the speed limit maybe max was, what, 55? Oh, we were cavemen back then, right? It was 55, and, and, and here's the kicker. Most people back then, guess how fast they went? What was it? 80. Yeah, no, no, usually it was a lot slower paced. We, we didn't get in a hurry, it seemed like, back in those days. Now we have such technological advances that... For some reason, it's created, it, you know, it's, it's nice to have it, and it tells you, turn left here. You've gone too far. Turn around. You know, all those things. That's helpful, but it seems like we're just in more of a hurry than we ever have been, and I don't understand why. We need to slow down. Look at the wonderful testimony of God's Word. It gives sight to us. It gives sight. Second thing it does, we see in verse 132, he says, Turn to me and be gracious to me after your manner with those who love your name. God's word gives grace. It offers grace to the guilty. You see, before Christ, we're simple. And, and, and I'm okay even saying now in Christ, I'm still a simple man. God is everything, and, and, and I'm not. But he gives grace to us who are guilty. Turn to me and be gracious. Do you realize that Christianity is different from every religion? Every world religion is about working, earning, doing. Only Christianity is about what's been done for us. Amen? That's the, it's the key difference. Every religion is about being good enough, earning your place, earning your right, doing enough good deeds, going door to door, right, on a mission. Used to be just the men. I'm talking about Mormonism now. Now it's the young ladies as well because the men were all getting saved. They were meeting Christians who were telling them about Jesus. They were giving them links in their phones to read about biblical Christianity. And so they changed the rules and won't allow them to have their cell phones except in their group meetings with their supervisors. They're afraid of the truth, but they're trying to work their way to heaven, earning their spot. But God's Word offers us grace. It gives grace to the guilty. Romans 6, 23 tells us the, the fault of works-based religion. It says, for the wages of sin is death. All that religion earns us when we try to earn God and salvation is death. The wages of sin, that's all we can earn. We can never earn anything better and beyond that. God says so. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? You don't earn it. It's given to us graciously. Each of us stands guilty of treason against our Creator. If we receive His perfect justice, we will be eternally cast out of His presence. Amen? Deserving His wrath and deserving hell. And yet, grace steps in in the form of the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Grace goes to the cross. Grace gives up His life. It's not taken from Him. Grace rises again three days after He was put in the ground and a rock was rolled in front. Grace offers us salvation through Jesus Christ. That's what God has done for us. And His Word tells us about it. So the psalmist says, Turn to me and see all the worth that I bring to you. Turn to me and see all the good that I have. Turn to me and see how much I deserve this, God. That's not what it says, is it? Turn to me and be gracious unto me. That's what the psalmist says. And that's what we say who know God. Amen? It's God's grace that makes us what we are. Amen? Thirdly, God's Word gives footing to those who are floundering. Look at these next four verses. 133, establish my footsteps in your Word. A firmness, establish, set it 
set it in stone. Establish my footsteps in your word. Do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man, that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of water, because they do not keep your law. So again, we come back to the opposition. There are those who oppose the truth. We see it every day. It's still happening today. But in these first two verses, 133, 134, he prays, the psalmist prays that sin, that iniquity will not reign over him. It will not be master over him. And he wants to be firmly established in God's word so that it doesn't happen. So that, that he can be free from the terrible tyranny of sin. And folks, listen. Apart from Christ and his grace, there is no freedom and there is no goodness we're all captured by the tyranny of sin apart from the saving faith in, through Jesus Christ. Amen? Apart from our saving faith in Jesus Christ. By grace through faith in Jesus. So, 135, he says, Make your face shine upon your servant. Teach me your statutes, your word, your statutes, your law, all those things, talking about his word. So he says, Make your face to shine upon me. It's reminiscent of Numbers chapter 6, verses 24, 25, and 26. It's a beautiful prayer. The Lord bless you and keep you. You familiar with this? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance and give you peace. What a beautiful thing to consider for others. Amen? Not just for ourselves, but for others. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance and give you peace. So He prays, Make your face shine upon your servant. If God's going to give us light through his word, God has to graciously expose himself to us. Or I should say expose us to himself. Amen? He has to reveal himself to us. Bless us with his countenance, with understanding, with wisdom. And that's, that's what the psalmist prays for, these, all these things throughout this psalm. Week after week, we've been seeing more insights into this person who loves the God of this word and the word of God. So in 136, he says, My eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep your law. Now, there's two thoughts here, and commentators are divided over which of these is accurate. Is he talking about shedding streams of water because his eyes don't keep the law of God? Possibly. Possibly. And that's, that would be accurate. It should break our heart when we sin, amen? In fact, if we're not careful, other sins bother us more than our own sins, oftentimes, right? Especially when they sin against us. But our sins should bother us. It should bring us to tear because we hurt the heart of God. It's not just that we break His law, amen? We sin against the holy, righteous God who gave all for us to save us, to redeem a people unto Himself. We should walk in holiness and thankfulness every moment of every day, amen? And yet we get so distracted. Perhaps that's what the psalmist means. But just maybe in light of the others who do not keep his law, right? In light of those others who, who are, are not keeping his statutes that we've talked about, in light of those who are oppressing the psalmist that we've been learning about, just perhaps his heart breaks because... So many people seem indifferent to God. So many people could care less about holy things. All we care about is ourself. All we care about is number one. And it's not God. And it's supposed to be, right? We're so self-absorbed, so self-consumed, so conceited and prideful. And we see this sadly in the church as well. There's so much of it. Me, me, me. What do I get out of this? I'm going to look for another church because they don't have something for me or my kids. Or, and, and, and maybe that can be from a good place, but so often it's about being catered to rather than the ideal that we are the body of Christ together and it takes all of us to do the work that we're called to do. Amen? It's not about coming here and being catered to. And we know that here as a church. I know that. But I think we should be reminded and we should help tell others that church is... Is, is where we come to gather and worship God, amen, and hear from God's word together, corporately, so that together we can boldly go. Just went into Star Trek mode there, sorry. But so that we can go out into the world 
and make disciples. Amen? Glorifying God as we do. But it's not about us. It's not about us. It's about the glory of God. And again, I think we've lost that because we've lost this sense of marvel and wonder and all. We have a consumer mentality here in America. We have fad churches that do faddish things. We have laser shows, light shows, fog machines, right? Give away cars and whatnot. Draw crowds, and, and we seek to then turn those crowds into serious-minded disciples. That's never worked. What you win them with is what you win them to. Amen? If you win people with pizzazz, all they're looking for is pizzazz. But if we win people with the simple gospel that, hey, guess what? You're lost. You need Jesus. Right? Then that's the focus. We need to get back to that focus as a church in America. Amen? And that's what we need to export to Africa and to Asia and wherever else our missionaries go. Not the false health and wealth and prosperity nonsense. God wants you to be rich. Look at my bling. I know they probably don't say that, but that's what they mean, right? And we dress in our $2,000 sweaters, Stephen Furtick, Easter Sunday. $2,000 shirt was given to me. Thank you, Mr. Mazzola, right? Didn't cost me nothing. Now, it's nicer than any shirt I've ever bought for myself, but I didn't pay a cent for it. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. The sleeves are a little long. Josh helped me out rolling them up, right? With a fire, no, the marine roll, right? It's supposed to roll them up this far to show off your cannons right up here, but I don't have any cannons, so we left them down here. All right. But where do we invest our time and our talents and our treasures as a people of God? That's telling, is it not? It's telling. So, we need firm footing in the Word of God. Establish. That's what we pray for. And then when we see others who, who, who are sinning and who are breaking God's law, it should break our hearts. And it should make us want to pray for them and to speak the truth. Amen? Amen? Are we speaking the truth in love to a lost and dying world? People need Jesus. Amen? And, and, and let me just say this. People need Jesus more than we need Trump to be our president, okay? Now, I have a preference how things go politically, but it pales in comparison to Jesus. Amen? That's the most important thing. No president is going to turn the tide. Jesus, when he changes this life and that life and this life, and when lives are changed, things change here on this planet. Amen? We need to be about the mission of the church. So ask yourself this. Christian, do you talk more about politics than you do Jesus? Let's do something else. Let's meddle another way. Christian, do we talk more about our boat than we do Jesus? And fill in the blank with whatever it might be. Amen? We need to do a serious heart check. Do we really love God and His Word the way we profess on Sunday mornings? It should show up on Monday mornings and Monday nights and Tuesdays and every day of the week. So God's Word is what gives us that footing. When we flounder, it's God's Word. And it keeps us where we're supposed to be. Three things so far that we see God's Word can do. Now let me speed up a little bit here. Look at the next thing. God's Word is trustworthy no matter what people do. I want you to think about this. No one can undermine the Word of God. Righteous are you, verse 137, O Lord. And again, he uses the covenant name Yahweh. Righteous are you, O Yahweh, and upright are your judgments. You have commanded your testimonies in righteousness and exceeding faithfulness. My zeal has consumed me because my adversaries have forgotten your words. So again, why I think he's shedding tears over, over them people, how they're not keeping God's word, I think it's sandwiched between his concern for other people here. Now, again, we should obviously be concerned with our own sin. Absolutely. But I just don't think that's what's in view in verse 136 there. However, we see that God's Word is trustworthy, and it doesn't matter what people do. Think about this. God always does what's right, amen? Has God ever made a mistake? Will He ever make a mistake? No. He knows the beginning from the end, amen? He is the beginning and the end. There's nothing that surprises Him. There's nothing that catches Him off guard. He has no plan B. Everything unfolds according to His sovereign plan. Amen? And if that's true, 
and it is, then we should trust God and realize that, that He is trustworthy and it doesn't matter what people do. Now think about the choices that we make from day to day. Some are more serious than others. Oftentimes there are moral choices that we have to, we have to be involved in making. Those can be very difficult, I understand. But no matter what other people do, no matter what choices other people make, God's Word will still remain trustworthy. The late 20th century, Brooks, you can correct me if I'm off here, but postmodernism really became the, the flavor of the day. Late 20th century. It was building. The roots were always there building. But that was really, that became, I guess, the religion of humanity, at least in America, probably in Europe. Postmodernism. And the ideals, and we're just going to summarize a few things here, but postmodernists teach that there's no God, first of all. There's no such thing as an absolute right or wrong, that each person individually defines what's right or wrong for them, that morality is singular, basically. That your morality doesn't necessarily affect my morality. Now, folks, that's nonsense. Reality tells us how wrong that is. Amen? I mean, it's just, it just doesn't work. I mean, if you know someone who still thinks those things, here's my challenge to you for them. And this is for their good. Now, you'll enjoy it, but it's for their good. Walk up to someone who believes this way and just, I mean, slap the tar out of them right in the face. Hit them as hard as you possibly can. Open-handed because that's more insulting, all right? Do it, all right? I'm, I'm telling you, hit as hard as you can and ask them where the sense of wrong comes from. It was right for you to do it. Who are they to say that you're wrong for doing it? It's absurd. It's absurd. There is an absolute standard of morality. There's an absolute standard of truth. This ideal is what's true for you is not necessarily true for me. It's self-centered and it's illogical. It's inconsistent. God's Word is trustworthy. Notice Psalm 119, 89 that we looked at several weeks back. Forever, O Lord, your Word is settled in heaven. Amen? Forever. It doesn't change. It's not fleeting. And that brings us to these next two verses. Your word is very pure. Therefore, your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. This is my life verse, by the way, verse 141. I am small and despised. That's my life verse. I just threw that out there for you. You can enjoy that, all right? Everybody has these. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, plans for good, right? That's usually the kind of verses people pick. This is mine. I am small and despised, but God is big, and He's awesome, amen? And He loves us, and He's good, so His Word then is trustworthy no matter what people say, no matter what they say. And I've heard all the small jokes. I've been small my whole life. I don't think I was ever tall. I used to be the second smallest in, I think it was first grade, and then Chuck Davis had a growth spurt, and he was forever taller than me after first grade, all right? We were like always kind of neck and neck, but... But I've heard it. There's really no new jokes for the most part. I think a couple weeks ago I heard one that was pretty awesome. I'd never heard it before. I'm like, that one's good. But usually, I mean, I, I've pretty much heard them all. But no matter what people say, God's Word's still valid. It's still true. It never undermines itself. The Scriptures have been thoroughly tested in the fires of persecution even. You look historically. God's Word has been, been, been sought to be destroyed. It's never happened. It will not happen. His word endures forever, amen? And though we may seem to be irrelevant, we may seem to be small, and though we are absolutely despised as Christians today, God's word will remain trustworthy. Verse 142, 143, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. God doesn't change. Morality doesn't change because God is a moral agent. He's a moral being. He gives His attributes, those communicable attributes of holiness, of righteousness. He shares those with His creation. There's a standard there for how we're to be. And so, sometimes we don't feel up to the standard. Trouble and anguish come our way, verse 143. Yet your commandments are my delight. God's Word is trustworthy regardless of how we feel. Our feelings change, right? What did Martin Luther say? Feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the... Word of God, not else is worth believing. Not else. That means nothing else is worth believing. The Word of God is our standard. Amen? And so, no matter how we feel, it doesn't change. You may experience trouble. You may experience distress like the psalmist was experiencing. But our feelings never change God's Word. His standard of truth, of morality, and even of hope. 
for us. So our feelings can deceive us. Remember, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between a move of the Holy Spirit and indigestion if you don't know God's Word. I've seen it. I have. I've seen a lot of stuff that gets called a movement of God. And it doesn't turn out. And it surely doesn't line up with God's Word. The Word is the standard. Amen? The Word is over my emotions and over my feelings. It's over my thoughts. It's over the intentions of my heart. The Word stands. So no matter what people do, no matter what people say, no matter how I feel, God's Word is still the anchor. The last verse, 144. Your testimonies, the psalmist says, are righteous forever. And so he says, give me understanding that I may live. So God's Word is trustworthy. It's true. It's factual. It's relevant. No matter how long we're here on this earth. No matter how long we live. That won't change God's Word. But I'm going to save that. God's Word's trustworthy. It's not the length of our life, but the depth of our life that matters. It's not how long we live. And, and I know some people, it seems to be, it, it, they get taken way too soon for us. Amen? We've experienced that recently, here as a church even. But there are no mistakes with God in His timing. I don't, I don't claim to understand it. But I know that every day that we have is a gift from God. Amen? Every day. And some of us get more than others. And it seems like evil people get more than godly people. And I don't understand it. But, but this, I think it's the grace of God. That they would come to repentance. Amen? Perhaps that's what it is. But it's not the length of our life. It's the depth. It's the quality of our life. And the depth of our life comes from laying hold of God's Word and obeying it. That's where real life is. That's where freedom is. It's in God's Word. We're free to be holy. And some people think, that doesn't sound very freeing to me. Then I just have to wonder, do you really know Jesus? And I don't say that to be ugly, but there's a freedom in Christ, amen? There's joy unspeakable for the Christian. And if you don't know those things, then please Go to your inner room and open up 1 John and read through that letter. There's at least 11 different proofs in there. The Christian does this. The Christian does this. The Christian does not do that. Is that you? Use it to test your faith to see if it's refined as in the fire like pure gold. But God's testimonies are trustworthy. Amen? So lay hold of God's Word. Cling to God's Word and... Let's obey it. I know this life is hard. And, and if the Lord tarries in coming for the church, I believe it's going to get a lot harder for us. And that is not a your best life now kind of message, I know. That's not going to draw crowds to this church, but that's not the end game. We're about the truth and making disciples. Amen? And, 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 and the, the closer I believe we get to the end, I think the darker and the harder it's going to get for the church until Jesus returns for the church. And I believe that's going to happen. What's going on in the Middle East right now could very well be speeding up that clock. It could. Or this could be another in the long list of ways that evil forces are trying to squash God's chosen nation. And he hasn't set Israel permanently aside. Please know that from the book of Romans. He's not done. Perhaps he is speeding up the clock from our understanding. Obviously, God's timing is perfect. But no matter what happens in the days going forward, we can trust God and His Word. Amen? We've got an anchor of hope, of certainty, a firm place for us to rest our feet upon. So, what does the Word of God do then? It helps us to practice being righteous in a world that's not. And isn't that kind of what we're supposed to do day in and day out? Christian? Amen? No matter what our job does, we represent Jesus. No matter what the school's teaching, guess what? You represent Jesus. No matter what those churches are doing, worldly as they may be, God's churches do what? Just what He calls us to do. We continue to walk in holiness. Amen? Let's be that kind of church. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this word. I am humbled just how week after week this word 
seems to line up with the very things that we're going through and the very things that we need to hear and be about. So, Father, thank you for this sure word. I thank you for this wonderful word as we have studied about just briefly this morning. Father, I pray that you help us to be a people of this word, a people of the book. I pray that those old Islamic slurs against us, the people of the book, would actually be true of us, that we would be people who are in the word day in and day out, and that we would be about transformation from this word, not just having information to win debates, but to have transformation in our own lives. I pray you would change us to make us more like Jesus. And Father, I pray that if there's anybody here today, again, if there's anyone here who is under the convicting power of your Holy Spirit, that through the proclamation of this word, Father, I know that you can impart life. You can change a dead heart and replace it, make it become a live beating heart. The heart of stone removed, a heart of flesh. You can do those things as we see in Jeremiah. You can still do that today. So I pray that by grace through faith that you would bring people into the realization that they can't save themselves, but only Jesus can save them. I pray that they would be convicted. I pray that they would be drawn to repentance and they would confess, God, oh, have mercy on me, the sinner. And we ask these things in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen.